please welcome the director and producer of Big Hero 6, Don Hall and Roy Connolly. Don, this is an excellent jacket. This uh, excellent Big you. Hero 6 jacket. I have to point it down. Very subtle product placement <laughs> for you. And you brought one for everybody, I presume? Uh, Not so much. Okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry. Uh, let's start talking about the genesis of this movie with you, Don, because um, this may not be apparent to a lot of people here, but this is a Marvel movie of sorts. Can you talk about the origins of Big Hero 6? Yeah, it's more of a Disney movie with Marvel DNA, we yeah. call it. So, um, about three and a half, four years ago, as I was finishing up Winnie the Pooh, uh, I got to thinking about what my next project would be. And John Laster, who our boss, uh, always has the directors look into what they're passionate about. And uh, I got to thinking about it. And as a kid, I loved Disney animation, but I also loved Marvel. It's where I really fell in love with drawing and telling stories. And so I got very excited by uh, maybe taking a Marvel idea, or Marvel characters or stories, and bringing it over uh, into our building and doing it as an animated feature. So I pitched that idea to John, and, and he thought it was awesome. And uh, so I started looking for, um, started making lists of, of different characters and different stories. And I came across this really obscure title called Big Hero 6. Uh, first, it was just a title that intrigued me. And then I looked into it further, and it was a Japanese superhero team, like the Japanese Avengers. And I thought, wow, that's really cool. And uh, I got my hands on a couple copies of the, the comics, and I read them. And I just really liked the characters, I liked the tone. Um, and not only that, but we could you, you could tell there could be a really emotional story mm. uh, here between a 14-year-old super genius who loses his older brother and this robot, uh, his brother's robot this uh, named Baymax who becomes sort of a surrogate big brother and a healer to heroes. So um, even though it was kind of obscure by Marvel standards, uh, it had all the makings of, of a great animated film, and I pitched it to Laster and, and the other directors, and, and he greenlit it. Uh, how scary is that, pitching to John Lasseter, by the way? Oh, it's not scary at all. Okay. Well, maybe a little. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you know, you, you know, we, we all are pretty comfortable working together now. And, and uh, so, because, uh, you know, he really works alongside us during the making of this film. I mean, he, he's there from the beginning pitching ideas, and, you know, he's the one that kind of green lights them. But he's also there with us in, you know, by the end of the film when he's in editorial with us and, and you know, uh, looking at animation. So he's there on a big scale, but also there uh, for the details. And it's... Uh, it's just so awesome having a filmmaker be our boss. Yeah. Uh, it's it's just the best uh, the best feeling in the world. So, yeah, I, lo I love John. And uh, and Roy, if I could bring you in, I mean, you've been uh, working at Disney now twenty one, almost twenty two years. Twenty one years, yeah, it'll be twenty two years in May. Do you but know the? No do you know one's the, counting. <laughs> yeah, do you know the exact date? Oh, we're counting. Uh, May the third, frankly. Yeah, <laughs> I, know, I remember it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> distinctly. Uh, so, how do you get involved with movies? At Disney Animation. Well, you know, m movies are always developed from the concept of the director. So uh, Don pitches a project, and then at some point when that project is ready to move forward, they'll bring me in. And uh, I came in and uh, helped out, and uh, we had a great time. Uh, basically, Don is a master storyteller. Chris Williams, who is the co-director, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. <laughs> He's in Los Angeles um, trying to recover from a flu. Yeah, Chris got the flu right before, uh, you know, right right uh, when we were beginning to fly out here. And yeah. so We were fortunate. We went to Seoul first yeah. because the, the film's uh, opening in, in Korea next week. Uh, and he stayed back because there were some marketing duties he had to do. Fortunately, we were in Seoul when he got the flu, because yeah, otherwise we'd flu. probably be down with it right now yeah. too. But anyway, he's here in spirit. So he's definitely here in spirit. But yeah, you know, it's it's always the, it, a director driven, and then w the producer is really there to put their vision on the screen. So it was uh, it was Don really that, that drew you onto the project, yeah. or the or the story, for example. Yeah, absolutely. Both. I guess. Okay. And uh, can you talk about the, the changes? Not many people may know the comic, but uh, Baymax, for example, in the comic book is substantially different from the, the, uh, the, the version we see on screen. Yeah. What was it that made you want to change Baymax to what we see now? And what made you latch onto him as the sort of heart of the movie? Well, um, yeah, in the comics, he actually takes a couple forms. You know, one form is sort of this synthesoid dragon thing, and then he also is uh, in a more kind of mech, traditional kind of mech form. Uh, and so that was one of the big challenges early on. I knew that, ba you know, Baymax was central to the story um, of of being, you know, the becoming hero surrogate big brother and a healer. But what form he would take, I, I had no clue. And other than a desire to put something on screen that we'd never seen before, that was sort of our mandate. And um, so I did research. I went to all the top robotic schools in the United States. I went to MIT, Harvard, uh, and Carnegie Mellon. And I didn't really know what I was looking for. 
just something different, something unique. And and not only that, but he had to be kind of appealing. And, and we had this term, huggable robot, uh, that was kind of in the back of my head. And it was at Carnegie Mellon University that I met a researcher named Chris Atkinson, who was doing research in soft robotics. And essentially, they're making robots. Uh, it's very bleeding edge technology, where they're going to be making robots made of vinyl that are inflatable. And essentially, they'll be used in the healthcare industry in the future. And the minute I saw that technology, I was blown away by it. And I, I could see where that could be our character. And so his, his entire persona, his personality, the idea that he's a, a healthcare companion, that wasn't in the comic books at all. That came from that research trip. And, uh, and Roy, can you talk about the, uh, the technological advances? I know there are lots for this movie, but some of the ones that r really drove Big Hero 6. Yeah, I, th I think the biggest one is uh, our uh, lighting system. We, we developed a whole new rendering system that we call Hyperion. And essentially, it's a ray trace system. It's a glo we call it global illumination. Uh, and, and you know, our old uh, rendering system essentially used a one bounce light uh, system, which uh, you put a virtual light in the computer, and there is a virtual camera, and that light would bounce off an image and then come into our virtual camera. What happens with uh, uh, Hyperion is that it's really more f physically uh, accurate in terms of how light acts. So uh, you can dial in literally to infinity the number of bounces that the light will take. Uh, and it really gets us to a, a, a much more realistic place much quicker. And it also gives us much more time to iterate and really make it perfect. It's, it's a little bit more like lighting from live action instead of doing stage lighting. And, uh, and Don mentioned a number of research trips, a lot of you know deep research on this movie. Yeah. Do you, as producer, to get to go on these these trips to Tokyo, to San, San Francisco? Yeah, yeah. Uh, on on this one, I did not go on the trips, although I did do a lot of the uh, searching for people to come in and talk uh, with us. Um, one of the big things, because we're dealing with loss, uh, was we brought in uh, psychiatrists and some social workers to talk about teenage loss. Oh, really? yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, it was really important, and when, whenever we're working on a story, research is the the primary uh, asset that we use, and uh, so it was really, really a, a, a mind-opening experience. This film, and uh, obviously at Disney, uh, you have uh, a fairly big shadow. There are fifty. This is the fifty-fourth movie. There are fifty-three before that. It's, it's a movie that deals with loss. You have the likes of Bambi, The Lion King. Do you feel that weight on your shoulders when you're making a movie like this with themes like this? Uh, maybe a little bit. I mean, it, you know, essentially we're we're all big Disney fans. That's what drew us to work there. We all kind of have, a, have similar stories. You know, at one point in our childhood, we saw a Disney animated film and uh, fell in love with the medium, fell in love with the idea of working there, and you know, chased that dream down in, until it happened. So um, I'm not sure if I would call it a weight. Other, I would call it more just a healthy respect for our legacy <laughs> and. Yeah, yeah, actually, inspirations, that's a, that's, a, that's a good word for it. And so you just want to make sure that what you're creating, the story you're telling, uh, can sit on the shelf next to all those classics. Absolutely. Uh, let's meet Baymax now. We have a clip from the film. Uh, Don, I don't know if you want to set this, this up. Yeah, this happens about, uh, I'd say, probably about the beginning of Act Two. Um, and so what has happened? Well, we meet our character, Hiro Hamada, 14-year-old super genius. Uh, but he's essentially kind of wasting his gift uh, doing back alley robot fights where there's illegal gambling and this kind of that. He's kind of a hustler. Uh, and his older brother, Tadashi, who's also a, a roboticist, uh, wants to get him interested in going to college um, and stop wasting his time in back alleys um, bot fighting gangsters. So uh, he inspires here to by, by taking him to his college and meeting his friends who are working on all these really cool projects. And, and Hero does get inspired to go to college. And so he applies himself, he makes an invention, and there's sort of a, a expo type of thing to get into the school. He presents his invention, which are these really cool things called microbots. And he essentially, he does get into school. And it's, it's this really great feeling. You know, his brother's proud of him. Hero's feeling really good. And right on the heels of this, uh, there is a fire in the expo hall. And Tadashi rushes in there. Tadashi is Hero's older brother. Rushes in there to save somebody and ends up dying in an, in an explosion. And so Hero gives up on going to college. And, and he's really in sort of the throes of depression when we meet Tadashi. Uh, Tadashi's robot, Baymax, mm. uh, comes to the forefront here. That may be the most thorough clip setup I've ever had here. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy the clip. I've seen the movie a few times. <laughs> Yo, what? Thank you. Oh. Great stuff. Hands up who wants a Baymax. Oh. 
Um, there you go. <laughs> yeah, y'all do this. <laughs> Might as well. uh, are we close to getting a Baymax? How close? I don't think we're quite there yet. It's going to be a few <laughs> years. But you know what's interesting is I, I've been getting uh, emails from some of the um, scientists you know that consulted on the film, and and they've been going to lectures and. You know, uh, Baymax is now becoming sort of um, sort of the pitch person for soft robotics. You know, so it's come full circle. Like they inspired me, and now this creation is sort of inspiring them to hopefully get more funding. For this technology. Chris Atkinson, who was the chief roboticist who we we met with, uh, was very excited. He, we invited him to our rap party. And when he saw the film, he thought, oh, boy, my funding is going up. So it was a good thing. <laughs> it's it is, good. It's such a wonderful pro-science movie. Uh, yeah. Was that part of the uh, appeal? Well, you know, for me, what I, what I really love is the fact that it's a, a pro-intelligence movie. You know, and These kids are all really smart. And their superpower is really their technology and their brains. And uh, I think it's a great message. Okay, now if you have any questions for Don and Roy, put your hands up. Wow, right away, right, away, right here in the front yeah, row. We have microphones <laughs> coming around. Hi, first of all, I've seen it. It's absolutely amazing. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Um, that idea of going full circle, Marvel influenced you. I was wondering, is there any opportunity for you influencing Marvel and creating a new series of comics? Uh, that's, a, that's actually a good question. I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, we've never... Uh, broached the subject with uh, Casada, but it's it's certainly not an unappealing idea. Um, it's just we haven't had time. We just finished the movie, you know. Now we've been promoting it, but it'd be kind of cool. Yes, so please. we'll see what happens. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you very much. Any more questions for? No, oh, right here at the back. The, How do you the, select the, your stories? The, yeah. the question of uh, every every uh, uh, meeting. Big Hero what? Seven. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, we don't know what I I don't know. We we don't know what to call it, so I don't know if there'll be a sequel. Can't can't put another number in it. <laughs> That's yeah. the barrier. Um, <laughs> that'll that'll dictate our decision. Um, so as far as selecting the stories, I kind of went into it a little bit. You know, it really comes from the directors. Uh, all of our our pool of directors are are tasked with uh, generating stories. And we never uh, pitch one idea. John asks us to pitch at least three. And the idea being that you don't put all your emotional eggs in one basket. You spread it out. And the, 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 the exercise of trying to pick three ideas or come up with three ideas that you're passionate about inevitably leads to one kind of poking through as the, the one that's the, the best one to go forward with. So uh, essentially, it's all the directors that are coming up with the stories. And in, and in terms of a sequel, we would go through the same process. We would, we would pitch a sequel with other films. If the sequel idea was something that was interesting, we would move forward with it. Uh, but uh, you, seriously, we've been running around the world opening this. We worked uh, like dogs getting it done. We, we Literally th five days before we opened at the Tokyo Film Festival, we got it done. So uh, we're going to take a little vacation and then we're going to figure gonna out what we're going to do. Vacation, yeah. no, a little vacation. Yeah. So I'm a the week, producer, a little vacation. <laughs> <laughs> and Roy, can you talk about your involvement as well in the in the story process? What, what's that like for a producer at Disney? You know, it's great because uh, I'm in the room pretty much with the story team all the way. Um, I actually come from kind of a development background, so um, I that's probably one of my favorite aspects of the film. Uh, but I'm pretty much involved from, you know, putting the writing team together and getting the story team together and all the teams. It's it, I'm I'm really responsible for making communication happen within the within the, the the project, and I work with it all the way through till the end in marketing. I'll be working on this until we get the DVD out, which comes out sometime in the end of March, and then. Uh, that's when I get my vacation. <laughs> but Don, you're okay. You're off pretty much now. Uh, no, no, no. We still have more promotion to do, and <laughs> and you know, uh, we were very fortunate. We got nominated for a BAFTA, yeah. so uh, we'll be coming back and, and attending the BAFTAs, and uh, also got nominated for an Oscar. So yeah, th there's all uh, all of that kind of cool stuff to. to and we do we too. open in China on February the 28th. Oh so yeah, wow. That's that's okay. kind of kind of the end of the of the delivery. Uh, any more questions for Don and Roy? Yes, please. Here in the front row. Thank you. Yeah, right there, guys. Um, I was basically just wondering, uh, obviously you see at Carnegie Mellon they were kind of working on a lot of soft robotics. What were some of the other universities, such as MIT, 
kind of working on, say, if Baymax wasn't inspired by soft robotics, what could we potentially have seen kind of in this movie if it was inspired by another topic of robotics? That's a good question. Oh, you mean if, uh, uh, if, if I didn't go with soft robotics, what, what, would, what other kind of form? Yes. Hmm. Well, Interesting. The one, the one thing we did know, uh, and we should talk about the Uncanny Valley. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, well, there's a certain term in robotics called the Uncanny Valley where, um, and I saw some of these robots, that where they get too humanoid and they get really creepy. Uh, and so we definitely wanted to stay away from that, and with ba that's why we chose to go really simple and kind of elegant with Baymax's design. You know, we were on attempt to be kind of almost a blank slate. I mean, there's not a lot there to express with. It really challenged our animators to come up with uh, a way for for this character to express. And and subsequently, I think you actually kind of pro uh, project yourself onto Baymax because he is such a blank slate. Um, as far as other technology goes, that's um, I'm not sure because I. I just fell in love with soft robotics, so I can't imagine. Sorry, I'm having a tough time imagining what like another version of Baymax. Um, the microbots kind of came from that as well. I mean, I did I did see. Um, well, early on we were looking at nanobots, and uh, I don't know if you guys know what nanobots are, but they're basically robots that are built on a molecular level. Um, and uh, I thought it was really cool technology, but not very cinematic, because you can't see them. So <laughs> I don't. It wouldn't really work. So it became the microbots. And, and so I kind of combined the idea of microbots that we saw at, um, I think it was MIT, actually, with uh, the swarm technology that I, that I saw um, on, on YouTube, actually. I saw scientists doing, uh, you know, programming swarms to kind of, uh, sorry, drones to fly around all in synchronized uh, orbit. So I thought those, I kind of combined those two technologies. So um, that was just another thing I found on the research trip. There was something about Baymax and, and his simplicity that really played into our hand in terms of animation. And our animation team is so strong. And uh, they had a catch phrase that they used. It was animation for um, Baymax. And we, the l least was, less was more. That was the idea there. So it, it worked to our advantage. Oh, we've got time for a couple of last questions. Uh, let's go here. There's a lady here in the second row. So I've seen the film already as well. Um, but I was wondering, could you talk about the process of developing the secondary characters like Fred, um, you know, Go-Go, Honey, they're all so great. And like, so what was, how did you come up with them because they're such individualistic characters? Well, y you know, uh, oh, thank you. Um, we we kind of had sort of a um, broad stroke idea of the characters. And then, you know, once, once we really start refining them in the writing and the storyboarding process. But it's really not until you get the voice talent that they really come alive. And, you know, we in, uh, auditioned several actors for each of these roles, and, and uh, uh, I, felt, I feel like we got the perfect people to play these characters, and essentially they, they brought so much of themselves to the character. Um, like, Genesis Rodriguez is Honey Lemon. You know, she was on an all-girl robotics team when she was in high school, so she's really smart, but she's also very sweet and innocent and kind of bubbly, and and uh, a little shy at times and so uh and jamie chung is, is kind of tough as nails like go go you know i wouldn't mess with her and and tj miller is fred <laughs> he, he kind of just is you know i don't know if you guys watch silicon valley but um uh, yeah it's pretty awesome uh and and you know what we love too is that uh, and and damon is wasabi to, you know he uh, he's not built like him but you know he definitely has the personality of him so um they what, what, what we love, uh, and Chris and I both love as directors, is, is when actors come in and they're not just reading lines. It's not just a paycheck. You know, they come in very passionate about the characters and have ideas for the characters and will improv. Because we spend a lot of time crafting scenes. I mean, we work like crazy writing and storyboarding these scenes and getting them just so. But then it's awesome to get down in the recording room and kind of just be free and, and let the actors, we'll record the scene as written, but we'll also encourage them to go off script and bring anything they can. Like TJ, you know, there's a, well, you guys haven't seen the movie yet, but, um, well, we asked him to come up with Fred's theme song on the fly, uh, and he literally sang about a 10-minute version of Fred's theme song that was amazing. And we could only use a little bit of it in the movie um, because A, it was too long, and there were parts of it that were, well, just... A little, a little, a little naughty, but um, it was hilarious. And so, I, yeah, we just love actors like that that can bring a lot to the table. 
Yeah, we never use voice actors. We always use actors. We always want people who are going to bring something to the role. And this has been, you know, these guys are are real friends of the production too. They've been so helpful in terms of getting the word out uh, about the film, and it's it's been delightful. Is there any chance of hearing the full ten minute? Fred Stairway to Heaven style <laughs> the yeah, backing like the, music the album cut <laughs> yeah. yeah it'd be pr- we talked about it yeah we'll have to see we'll have to see on the DVD if we can squeeze that on there Christmas number one I'm saying uh, okay there's time for one last question uh, there's this lady here, right here thank you um, you talked earlier about your research projects and obviously from the producing and everything else you're kind of captain of the ship king of communication what's the sort of time scales and so how long did the research take and then what's how long are you in pre-production and sort of how many iterations of Baymax have you had at this point? Well, this project was very quick. Uh, it was three and a half years from concept to completion. That generally doesn't happen. Uh, usually you're in development and your concept is approved like a year and a half into the, in, into the process. So uh, this one went very quickly. Um, you know, and t- it, Baymax we found very quickly. Um, yeah, he, he came together. You know, it was lightning in a bottle after that research trip, and and you know, from even his design, I mean, that we didn't iterate too much. It was it kind of came out of the box. She and Kim designed him, uh, and and the big question was whether he would have a mouth, and John felt like, no, nah, you don't need it. Just go with the two eyes, you know. Uh, and he at one point he had a little heart, you know, where his chip port is. That was about the two modifications we made. That was it. Other and than and that, seriously, <laughs> the, the, the weekend that uh, Winnie the Pooh came out, yeah. he was off on the research trip and found Baymax. So, and that was three and a half years ago. Yeah. So uh, and I have to say, the, one of the great things about working for Disney is here's a guy who did Winnie the Pooh. Uh, I just produced Tangled back in 2010, and we're doing a superhero film. And I think the, the fact that we have that kind of freedom and that kind of trust from the studio to just, you know, it's all about the inspiration, it's all about the vision. And if we have the vision, we can, do, we can tell any story we want. And as far as just how long do you spend in research, I mean, you kind of do that throughout the movie. Like any time a new idea comes up that needs researching, you know, we'll, we'll do it, we'll bring in experts or whatever. Um, as far as at the beginning of the show, I probably spent, what, like maybe six months? Easily six months, maybe a little longer, uh, just doing research. You know, I went to Tokyo, San Francisco, and just met with particle physicists and roboticists and people who are infinitely smarter than me. Um, so, yeah, it was at least six months to eight months, you know, of just research. So. That's a lovely note on which to end. Uh, Big Hero 6 is out on January the 30th. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Thanks for your questions. Thanks, of course. Thank Don you, Hall, guys. Roy Conley, thank you, guys. That's Thanks, great. everybody. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs>